Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Literacy Podcast. Melissa and Lori love literacy. We are very excited to talk with uh, the author of a piece that caught our eye from Student Achievement Partners, Achieve the Core. Melissa, I sent it over to you, and actually, I commented on it before I even said anything to you. I was you like, did. will it's you podcast fine. with us? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, Melissa, surprise. <laughs> but you know, if we're talking about texts and which texts should be taught in schools, I am all for that conversation, so... You didn't need, you didn't need to text me. <laughs> so the piece, the piece title is helping our students see themselves and the world through the books they read in our classrooms, the impact of text selection on students. And the author is the lovely Sheba Jacobs. So Sheba, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being welcome, here. Welcome Sheba. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to, to be here and it's, it's my first one. So uh, <laughs> this, is, this is like, yeah, just a good day. <laughs> awesome. We're that so- is something to brag about now. <laughs> <laughs> We're honored to be your first podcast. Yeah. I always say it's a resume builder. Now you can put a link in your resume to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so Shiba, tell us a little bit about yourself. Just, you know, before we get to dig into the article, just tell us yeah. about you. Awesome. So, um, so name's Shiba Jacob. I am a mother. I'm an educator. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a singer songwriter on the side. Cool. <laughs> like side side. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've been in the field for about 20 years. So um, I'm currently working with a network of schools out here in LAUSD. And I support school leaders with coaching teachers. And I support teachers, candidates also at a university out in Seattle. And um, I'm also pursuing my doctorate in educational leadership for social justice. I mean, so, <laughs> just a few things. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And, and so um, I started out as a teacher, actually close to you all. I was a teacher in Washington, D.C., um, yeah. an EL teacher, upper elementary, and then continued. I taught humanities uh, in Brooklyn and abroad in India. Um, I got my master's in language and literacy um, with, with always a love like for like you know, adolescent literacy and, Mm. you know, just um, those books that really bring our hearts out. Um, And then I left the classroom and started doing some work at an educational publishing organization. And the focus was on project-based learning and student-centered lessons and um, how do we learn about global issues and solutions and and really pushing students to think about that and what they care about. Um, And then, and then more recently in the more recent years, I've um, stepped into the school leadership space. So uh, started uh, doing work with the Center for Educational Leadership at the University of Washington. And that took me to doing it um, a year in Kenya uh, as a dean of instruction and learning uh, at a girls high school. Amazing teachers. Cool. Just, it was an incredible, <laughs> incredible opportunity to work with them. And I still look back with such fondness. Um, and at I think like really at the heart of this all has been this essential question of like, how do we engage students in the classroom and like help Mm. them to really see themselves in schools um, and yeah, just really like have that opportunity. So it's always been something I'm striving to, you know, do learn, um, support other teachers and schools with and um, just deepen my understanding um, and I, I think that was part of the impetus for even like writing my reflection in this, in this piece that you all saw. Yeah. I feel like you should be retired by now with all that. <laughs> done. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was like, I think our podcast on this resume is like a drop in the bucket compared to oh, all those really totally. cool things she said. <laughs> I, I loved the variety. And I also love when I hear like, you know, like I've been teaching for 15 years or 20, you know, I, like I love the, the yeah. dedication that entails and like being at school sites. So like, I've just had a, like, you know, variety because because I've just been like curious about these different um, mm. entry points in education. Um, but uh, yeah, my uh, love goes out to like the educators who have been in the classroom and are doing the on the ground work. It's, it's like so inspirational to see also. 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree. We could not agree more. <laughs> so when you mentioned that, you know, this, this idea of engaging students and then seeing themselves uh, is what kind of brought you to this, this, what did we say we're calling it? Tech article. <laughs> article. Anything you want. Article. <laughs> um, I want, like, is there anything else that, that sparked this? And then we can, we'll, we'll get into the, like, what's in it, but like, I'm just wondering if there's any other, like, how did, how did this come to be? The, the article itself? The article or, itself. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, first, like huge shout out to Achieve the Core um, and what yeah. they're doing. Like, I, I love their um, focus in the peers and pedagogy, like community-based blogs and like the mm-hmm. access it gives and entry points for, for teachers and educators. Um, yeah. So I was thinking about, I'm like, what, what is it like I want to say about like literacy and books and like um, students seeing themselves? And, and so it just took me to a place of reflecting on my own journey with literature and books. Yeah. Um, and now at this stage, at like 43 years mm-hmm. old, I can say like books have this profound effect on me. Like they really um, helped me to see humanity in this deep level. Mm-hmm. And I will say when I was in grade school, that was not the case at all. <laughs> like I had yeah. trouble as a reader in the early ages. Um, I didn't see books in the classroom um, that really represented uh, my background or um, really, you know, what the world was. So I, I think I wanted to kind of think through a timeline of like how this has changed and why it changed and like why that feels like. Um, we can target it earlier for students and we can um, help students at a a much earlier age than me, which was probably closer to like college, honestly, um, when I really got to fall in love with books and, you know, identify myself as like a lifelong reader. That's really interesting. I feel like, to be honest, as I was reading yours, I think it's natural to reflect on your own, right? Because your first part is a childhood reflection. And then you talk a little bit about when students start to see the world based on your experience and and how that played into it. And, and I was thinking, as I was reading about my own experience and thinking, I like fell in love with reading when I was younger as an escape, but the things that I chose to read were not necessarily (laughs) content rich, if you will. You know, it was very much like a a book series that, you know, I would just plow through the the book series. Um, and it wasn't, so, so I needed the school books to help me see the world. Right. And I think that that's the point that we're making here is like, you know, this is not, we're not talking about like, um, you sitting at home in your comfy chair with your blanket snuggled up reading a book. Like that of course is a student's free choice, but we're thinking about the books that students are reading in school and, and how they're helping them to, I think we've called it mirrors and windows, provide um, mirrors where they can see themselves in text, but then also provide windows to the outside world and give them just a broader base of experiences that they wouldn't have otherwise. So I'm curious if you could share a little bit about your childhood reflection and um, just kind of like summarize that for us. Sure. Uh, I was laughing in the last few weeks because my son recently has new phrase. He's a little over two and he'll say like, I see you. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I see you mama. I see you papa. Uh, And and like, just thinking about that again, like I, I see you. So like growing up, you know, um, there were texts that we read. Um, and as mentioned in the article, it was like snow treasure or 12 angry men, um, Mm -hmm. where the red fern grows. And so you know, interesting text, interesting storylines, like, you know, um, but I, in that larger context, um, you know, we had a diverse, somewhat diverse group of students, but, uh, that was a chance, I think. And that that's our opportunity for students to, or sorry, teachers to really step in and say like, who are my students? And like, mm-hmm. what other books could I bring in? Because I, I didn't see myself as a, a South Asian, uh, um, South Indian uh, person in these books represented, nor did I see, like, as I mentioned, like any other cultures really um, outside of, you know, um, predominantly kind of like um, white culture, like represented within the text. And so 
those were my windows that those were worlds I got to see and like mm-hmm. characters, like I said, you can connect to any character really who experiences universal kind of um, feelings, you know, of right. joy and grief and sadness. Um, and the immense amount of literature out there that I soon started to discover um, when we would take trips to India and um, my siblings and cousins would share books with me and I would start to read these other texts and think, oh, wow, like this is, <laughs> this is my culture and I'm seeing parts of my culture represented in, uh, you know, books like um, Midnight's Children, but wow, it's way beyond. I didn't even know this history. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that is really like a profound history that like um, I I should know about. So, you know, uh, (laughs) there was maybe a dissonance at times where like I was getting books outside as I was entering high school and later in um, my my years in high school, but I wasn't getting those books throughout my my time in schools. Um, and I can totally relate. Yes, I like the series. I absolutely babysit. <laughs> uh, you know, see that. <laughs> totally. Like, um, yeah. But yeah, that just that power of being able to to have an experience validated as a student. I, I can only imagine what that would have done, you know, in terms of um, just that kind of, uh, identity builder and that pride that, that could have been supported in schools too. And it was being done in a supplemental way and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Can I read a quote that really supports this? So, um, the end of your first paragraph with your childhood reflection, you wrote, while I could see myself in some of these books because of universal experiences like grief and love, limiting the reading experience to a few specific voices subconsciously taught me that only certain voices mattered. And I think that's so important. It just, it speaks to so many things because it's not saying that, um, you know, like those universal experiences are, are really, really important. And those connector threads, but we want to make sure that they're experienced within the context of lots of voices and lots of different representations. And that's where I think you're right. It does, it it could fall short if like, for example, I'm thinking like if a curriculum isn't high quality and students are not experiencing that, like, and they're, you know, choosing their own books or what have you, they might continue to, to choose books with mirrors because that's an easy an easy choice I think um, they might not even realize they're doing, realize right? like, it yeah like as a kid you're just like this book looks good but you're probably more likely to pick a book where it you know comfortable the person looks like you right or yeah. <laughs> there's some connection to your to your life yeah or it's a little happier so yeah I mean yeah. I don't know I guess <laughs> yeah I want well, I, I mean maybe not I guess it's just interesting to think about it in the context of that that quote that you wrote um I'd love, do you have any thoughts on that? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that particular. Yeah, that, that I, I think, and what you're saying also, Melissa, I'm thinking about like Gloria Ladson and Billions and that idea of like critical consciousness and, mm-hmm. and the ability to like, that's a deep look at like oneself. And, yeah. and so <laughs> like, how do we allow for that? Um, because you're right. Like, I don't know at like fourth grade what my like, <laughs> sense of self was, but I know I, I certainly like could name now like what I think was valued and yep. who was valued. Yeah. Uh, so totally. that that ability to like um, have opportunities for students to make sense, like we talk about sense making, like make sense of themselves mm-hmm. in the classroom, and like you know the 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 multitudes of who we are, and like the yeah the many things like I'm. Uh, you know, a mother and I'm an educator and, you know, like uh, right. how I introduce myself and how students see themselves like uh, with whatever abilities they have, like in, or hobbies and identities and culture identities and language um, and like celebrating that. And so um, I think there's true opportunities um, and, and, you know, if it feels like it's intimidating, it's, it's as simple as like those kinds of ways of like, Hey, like, like let's represent ourselves through a collage or like tell me about yourself through this identity map you know and and just opportunities for teachers to learn that much more so that a student can feel that much more um a part of that that classroom community yeah I'm 
I have a question for you that I don't know if you'll even know <laughs> the answer to because you were probably a child. <laughs> but I'm wondering, like, you, what I think is so fascinating about your story is that you had these two different experiences, right? Like most students only have that first experience, right? Of the like, this is what I'm getting in school, and they they know the texts, right? And they they know what they are. It's not like they don't know what text they're reading. They see them. But you had this comparison, right? Where you were able to like then go to India and find these texts that you're like, whoa, <laughs> right? Like this does show me who I am, my family, my culture, right? Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if that like experience helped you to see that like what was what was going on with the text you were reading in school and that they were mostly, you know, white European Americans <laughs> in these texts. Like, I wonder if you would even have no, like not, not that you would have noticed, that's not the right word, but that you wouldn't have had that aha moment if you didn't have the contrast experience. That's a great question. I think looking back now, I can reflect in that <laughs> right. way. I, I often think back to those days and like, I, I have to believe, I, I think I had gut feelings mm -hmm. about like not mm -hmm. belonging and uh, I've like dissected that as an educator then over, you know, the last, you know, several years and um, <clears throat> thinking about like where my identity started to like, where mm -hmm. I started to understand like, oh, it's because these things weren't validated in school. I get it. And like, oh, like, and, and something and in terms of a gut feeling told me, like, you know, it's, it's okay. And like, it's, it's time to like venture out. I, I really felt the need to, when you're talking about escaping, I was like, I need to escape. I need to like get out of this context because I know from reading books and having these opportunities to see another world, like there are other worlds out there and I need to, to get a sense of that. So I think to your question, Melissa, like where I may not have been able to name it at that point, yeah. I knew like I wanted to take action and I think, honestly, it's been a huge part of why, like, I got into education and my focus is, um, you know, this uh, idea of, like, how do we engage students meaningfully? What are, like, you know, culturally relevant pedagogies? And, you know, like, how do we do that in effective ways in the classroom? So I, I honestly think it set forth a trajectory um, and, uh, you know, my experience in college and teaching after, like, just mm -hmm. kind of opened that up and allowed me to see that. Yeah. Get ready for this crazy metaphor that I thought of while you were talking. <laughs> it reminds me almost of like, you know how some of your apps like run in the background on your phone and you don't know that they're running, but they are, <laughs> but you have. Oh, you mean you how actually... your phone is always listening to you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it, when you were talking about it, it reminds me kind of of that, right. Of like the students, especially at like an elementary level are probably not going to be like, able to name it or say like, well, why don't we have any books with someone that looks like me in it, right? They're most likely not going to have that conversation or even be upset about it to talk about it. But it's like that thing running in the background where you're like getting those messages that keep like, like it's a, I don't know, that's just like adding these messages keep adding up that like, you're like, okay, I keep seeing texts that aren't me so like what does that say about me <laughs> and my identity and my and the value of of who I am yeah I think at a young age those universal experiences are the the ones that tie us together right like the the grief the love the joy the challenges but in order like as educators it is our responsibility to expose students to lots of different right. experiences which means having them read and engage with texts that are, that are diverse. I mean, I, I think that that's the right. real, the real so bottom those line messages is, yeah, are, are, those messages are, are coming through. a little bit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and oh. that opportunity, even like now, I, I'm sure like you both are avid young adult readers, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm <laughs> to, um, but I was just thinking of like, um, I think it's Mercy Suarez changes gears. 
it, it's uh, this beautiful mm. book. Uh, and she's a sixth grader. I love middle school texts. And, uh, <laughs> and I read it like two years ago. And it's still I was like, wow, this is such a beautiful book that uh, talks about, you know, Mercy Suarez and her family and her culture. But it also talks about her grandfather, like and, and dementia and 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 like, Mm -hmm. this experience. And I was like, wow, like, I, you know, that's something relatable. And, you know, we're from different cultures, but I, we connect on that way, you know? And so that opportunity for like, we, we bring, um, texts to the classroom that are, you know, culturally diverse and like bring texts to the classroom that also speak to like students' experiences, like of what they're experiencing, like at such a young age and, and truth telling, um, on that ability is powerful. So that, that ability to like celebrate, but also like honor, like what they're, they're living right now. Um, and they're Mm -hmm. living a lot. So I I think that's, that's been, um, that's always a a powerful piece too, for them to go that much deeper with the text Mm -hmm. they're reading. Yeah. I I'm thinking about too, how that, how the, going that much deeper also means like in illuminating different time periods and different topics. So, you know, kind of broadening that, uh, window idea to not just be race-based or religious-based or whatever it might be, but to, to broaden it to different, uh, different experiences at different points in time, going back in time and, and helping students to take students, taking students to a point in history where, it's, it's much more relatable and, and easier to understand when you walk alongside a character or a person in a text versus just like reading about a point in history. Um, and I think that that's where like in, in those upper intermediate grades as well, I mean, all throughout elementary, but as you go deeper into those, um, upper intermediate and then the, the middle school grades, that's where that really starts to be impactful and helps them to like, think about their own identity in the relationship of, of others. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I reflected on this a little bit in the piece, but my, uh, one of the books we read in my sixth grade class with my students, and this was years ago, so, uh, <laughs> but, um, was Diary of Anne Frank. And these were my students in, um, Flatbush, Brooklyn, you know, and, uh, Caribbean, African-American, Latino, and, they, the connection they had to Anne Frank was like so beautiful because she yeah. was just like teenager, like just ha- like, you know, a boy didn't like her or, you know, like there's that, that piece of it. That's just uh-huh. like every, everyone can relate to that. And like mom having, you know, these issues are like, you know, not connecting. Uh, but then getting to this deeper context of what's going on in the world and like what's happening historically and why, why are humans doing this? Getting into those big, like essential questions and the entry point, like Lori, like what you're saying, like a character, like you, you can relate to so much, but then opening your world to like, oh my gosh, like what happened during that time in history throughout the world? And, right. and that, that is just such a beautiful way to like broaden the understanding and deepen the empathy. It's yeah. so funny you bring that one up. I We wrote in Baltimore, we had, we used to have <laughs> our, our, our own curriculum where we wrote one for a diary of Anne Frank. And I actually wrote it and I had so much trouble with it because if you just stick to the diary itself, I was like, yeah. she's so much more concerned with Peter <laughs> you know, than she is with what's going on in the outside world, which is like, you know, I mean, one of the biggest things that ever happened in our world. <laughs> and I was, but I always, I had so, so, so much trouble writing that to like, you know, how do I bring that bigger picture to the students? Um, but, but I did also say like, well, they can definitely relate to her, right? Because they're seventh graders and that's, that's what's on their mind too. So absolutely. Yeah. And that connection, like, yeah, the, those are like the everyday issues, but then she's in an attic, you know, and like, the, right, like right. so much is there. Um, yeah. And, and <laughs> we had, uh, um, survivor come, uh, a few years, like when mm. I was teaching that, uh. and that connection, like their ability to then interact in like real life, you know, with, you know, someone who experienced what they read up, like on some level, that uh, again, broadening their worlds, um, through those experiences too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What other texts did you have your students read Shiva? Uh, <laughs> again, uh, back in <laughs> 2005. So this, um, Bronx masquerade, Mm-hmm. which uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but um, yeah. 
a, yeah, a series of vignettes. It's, it's like poetry, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Is it? yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then um, Star Girl mm-hmm. uh, by Jerry Spinelli. And um, <laughs> America Street, which was a series of short stories about. Um, I taught you, that book yeah, in yeah, my okay. first few years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here. And um, I am forgetting. The Skin I'm In. Thank you, the skin I'm in. Yeah, yes, I'm looking yes. at your blog. Yeah, I'm, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, cheating. And, I'm cheating. Yeah, that's, and, and again, like to that point, right? Like I reached out to a student a year ago and he brought that book up and that was um, in 2006. But he's like, I, I'm still grateful for that like book because it like talked about my experience, you know, mm-hmm. um, as a dark-skinned African-American, you know, boy in school. So like, that's the, the things that stick with us, you know, I, I, yeah. I think that's profound. Like, and if I had that book, like what would I have written about in the blog that would have changed, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. like a series of things that were like, yes, thank you. Um, yeah. You know what I'm curious about for both of you actually is that, you know, I, again, I talk, taught a lot of those books and I love a lot of those books. And um, I think the, the change from, from when you were teaching Shiva is, you know, common core. Um, and, and, <laughs> and one of the big changes there is the text complexity, right? And so some of these like really great books that I love, you love, or kids love end up not being able to be taught because they're not at the text complexity for the grade level, or, you know, it, it would be at the text complexity for, uh, maybe a fourth grader where the content is not, you know, you know, they're not, they're not ready for the content of these, of these texts. So um, I, I don't even know what question I'm asking, but I guess I'm thinking like, I think that's maybe a challenge currently is like, how do we have these texts that are complex at the right level for our students, um, but also have this value that you're mentioning. And I'm not, I'm not saying all of those texts are not at that complexity level, but I think it has added a, an additional, like we can't just pick any text that we think is going to relate to our students. We have this like other bar <laughs> that we have to also meet. Right. Okay. Melissa, or sorry, Lori, were I, you going to add uh, anything? Yeah. I mean, I think th- like, when I think about texts like that, if, if they're not taught within the curriculum. And I mean, obviously we can't teach every single text. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's possible. Um, but we know that there are all of these rich experiences that we want to bring to students via texts. I mean, I think that there's incredible opportunities for teachers to, we call them in Witten Wisdom volume of reading. They're those, yeah. they're books that extend topics, uh, topic knowledge, and they continue to build student knowledge. And I think the, the ones that yeah, I think, are you thinking of, um, Star Girl, Melissa. Like, would that be an example of a text that might? I think that's be a really great example. A cool yeah. lower lexile that, but the topic, right. yeah, and the knowledge yeah. that students need to have going into that might not be something that a fourth grader might have. So it might be appropriate for, uh, you know, a fifth grade or a sixth grade student. But we well, you know the lexile is lexiling it a little bit lower. Right. I think that that's a, a great, a, a great example of a book where, you know, we are you're teaching about a topic that relates to that. And then you're having this, this classroom library, this, um, area that is representative of, of the knowledge that students are gaining in your tier one curricula. And then students can have the choice. And it's like, I also feel the need to say it's a, okay. If I'm uh, a a really, really fluent reader and I want to choose that, (laughs) that lower lexile text. Like that's not the time to be uh, sh- like never shepherd students on that. Um, because we all read the babysitters club. Cause we all read yeah. the babysitters club. Totally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and I, I think that that's somewhere where we can engage students at a time that is their time to, to choose and their time to build knowledge and to just enjoy to continue reading about a topic that's super interesting. Shiva, I'd love to hear what you think, though. Yeah, I love that. And it makes me think of, like, if you're doing this unit, um, like, uh, what does courage look like, you know? And so you're you're talking about yeah. the Watsons go to Birmingham and, like, a, using a complex text, like, throughout class. But then you're, like, previewing other books and showing students, yeah. like, hey, these are some other books. And here's, like, kind of the, like, main, like, you know, summary. And, like, uh, you might be interested. Like, this is accessible, you know. So just um, – allowing them to know the variety of other books that are out there and um, providing uh, them that kind of 
um, option in your library. Like, I love that. And uh, that ability to like for a, a student might say like, okay, great. This is about this context and history. And, you know, this is this, these characters, but I really want to know about that girl and how she dealt with bullying, you know, mm-hmm, like in this mm-hmm. context, like, in, yeah. you know, so, so providing them some of that information so that they can make those informed choices too, because they can see themselves in those other texts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you both for that. Because I think that's, you know, how do how do you value these books when you, when as a teacher, you're limited, right? You might be limited by what curriculum you're 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 teaching right you're given a curriculum those are the books right and so you're definitely limited by time (laughs) definitely limited by time right so yeah if there's only so many books in a year so like we can't necessarily (laughs) have a book yeah I also think every student in the class now that I'm thinking about it too there's so many opportunities like with um free apps I mean I know uh, there's a free app that my, well, my library uses called Libby. There's also one, it's like Overdrive by Libby. There, that, let, that gives students opportunities or people opportunities to, to use apps like that to have the audiobook component. Or, I mean, you can do any book from any library and read it or grab it on your phone, not do the book, but grab the book on your phone. Um, but there are lots of audiobook options too. And I think sometimes, um, like I even forget that. And that's something that I really enjoy is like an audiobook or, um, a podcast. There's so many podcasts that, you know, build knowledge on topics that are re- really great vetted. Um, even I think mm-hmm. LeVar Burton has one where he reads stories aloud. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, hello, that's perfect. Imagine like a middle <laughs> or a high school teacher, like, you know, so it doesn't have to be like a physical library. I just think reminding educators who are listening, there's lots of, Lots of creative ways um, to get students engaged now. Although I feel like saying that out loud, I'm like, I don't know if I'd put like a middle schooler on an app in a classroom like that on their phone. I would do it more strategically (laughs) just to make sure it is a little more structured. But I mean, there's just so many opportunities now to to have outreach into the knowledge that that you could continue to build. And and. I also think of like the the simple like strategic move of like even telling a specific student ba- because you've been building relationships with them like hey Melissa like mm-hmm. I think you'd really love this book um because it's about x y and z uh and so yeah. it's like oh like she's 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 like c- connecting that to like my yeah. book. I'm going to an honor yeah. yeah yeah because like you've recommended it to me in particular mm-hmm. Shoot, I was actually wondering about this as you were talking is there any danger in that where you're like potentially assuming, right? That, that like, I'm going to use you as an example, Sheba, because I know your background from your, your <laughs> article, but like, is there any danger in a teacher who, you know, just sees like, oh, I have Sheba in my classroom. She is an Indian American. So I think she's going to like this book. Is, is there any danger in like uh, offending somebody by... I <laughs> by doing that, that and I love it yeah. too and I'm yeah. glad that you're brave enough to ask it Melissa <laughs> yeah I think it's super important because there there is I th- and and I'd love to hear both of your thoughts but like there is a danger in like essentializing a student like oh you're this like you're mm-hmm. really gonna love this book mm-hmm. I, I think it's like how are you building the relationship with a student to really learn what they care about and like yeah. what they like are you're seeing like they're focused on during independent time or like they're talking about in conversations or they filled out like, you know, in a survey and you're like, Oh, I never knew that about you. You you'd probably mm-hmm. love this. So it's, it's not just about one part of their identity. It's really knowing them on a deeper level to, to make that informed choice because that could go sideways fast. If it's like, Oh, you're this, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> like race, religion, like ethnicity, like, gen- you know, and it's like, oh, okay, like that, that, that's not, that's, um, too superficial, you know, yeah. of an entry point. Like we, we really want to understand them at that much um, more profound level. Yeah. I, you know, it's so funny because I feel like kids are just complex little, little people. They're just <laughs> like adults and they have yeah. so many complexities. And I think that by like, if we look at them and we're making assumptions based on their appearance, like Melissa, like Melissa, I think that that was your question, right? I'm mm-hmm. making this assumption based on someone's appearance that they will like this. And I'm putting that in, in into a bucket. Um, well, yes, Shiva may like that. <laughs> it doesn't mean that she also may not enjoy these other 18 books or right. texts. Um, so 
I, I think it's a fine line because I would feel honored if a teacher came up to me who I, you know, really respected and was building uh, a relationship with who said, I really think you might like, you know, these several books, like if you choose one, let me know what you think about it. And I wonder if instead of like saying this book, it might be like, supplying a student with like a list of books or, Mm -hmm. um, a a few books and like maybe a couple different options for audio or podcast or something. Like, I think that you might love these to continue to learn more about whatever. I noticed you were really interested as we read this earlier, you had a lot of questions about it and, um, almost like taking cues from the student about what they are interested in. And I can give a quick example from Presley. Um, my daughter, I, I can't remember Sheba. I know I said she was home today and driving me crazy, but I can't remember other than <laughs> that. Um, what I mentioned, she is in fourth grade. Um, and so she is reading a book called Out of Hiding right now that she got from her school library. Also about the Holocaust. About the Holocaust. <laughs> I, right. And she got out of the library and um, she was like, this book it looks really interesting. And it took her a little bit to open up and she finally started reading it and she can't put it down now. And and I said, it, we always do the best parts of our day, at, you know, at dinner time as we're eating dinner. And, and I said, you know, what was the best part of your day today? And um, she said, well, first, the best part was reading that book. I mean, it was, <laughs> and she went into the details and it was a little girl, it's a little girl her age and uh, hiding. And and it was, it was really the, just a compelling part of their experience, this family's experience. And it was something that probably was really like, completely unfathomable to her. Like mm-hmm. I have literally never thought of this before in my life that this <laughs> happened, that this could potentially happen to anyone. And you, I mean, she's like, you have to read this part, mom here, start on page 39 and you're going to end when it says chapter five. And so I went, went and read it. And then we had a really rich conversation about it. And, you know, I thought, okay, so I need to like, to, to help her after this, like after she finishes this book, because I don't want this to be like the only experience she has with this topic, right? I'm like, okay, I'm going to see if um, m- one of my favorite kid podcasts is called But Why. And I'm going to see, and I think it's by Vermont Public Radio. So I'm going to go and see if they have anything on history topics such as this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to <laughs> go back in my arsenal and see if I have, can grab any other books um, that I can recommend to her that she might like as choices, because this is clearly a topic that like took her by surprise and, and stunned her a bit. And, you know, I mean, we've talked about it before, but not in this way. She hasn't experienced it deeply as she walked alongside a little girl, her age in this experience. And then also, um, you know, we're very close to Washington DC and I, you know, we were talking about it at dinner and my husband was like, we should do the go to the holiday an incredible experience. And I said, I think it's a great time for that. So as a family, we're supporting her, but I, I think too, there's lots, I, I want to just name on the podcast. There are lots of families of students that we teach who may not have those resources or may not consider all of these things that immediately my teacher brain just like sprung into action around. Um, and that's our role as educators to provide those. So, you know, if I were her teacher at school, I would have noticed how engaged she was with this text and like come up with some additional ways. Um, but yeah, I think like, it's like, not just like one thing, maybe like a wide swath of, of ideas or opportunities that help students feel like comfortable in going further into topics. Uh, did that, did that kind of, I I know I went off on a little tangent, but I, (laughs) I love that example. Yeah. (laughs) And it just it, happened to happen yesterday. <laughs> beautiful. And like her interest and in your ability to like engage with her and the moves you're saying, like as an educator too, like, you know, it's like you notice you're seeing what they're, they're like latching onto. And mm-hmm. then the, the like wide variety of options we have these days, like from like music to, you know, other research to apps, to podcasts, to books, you know, there's so much yeah. out there um, to, to, like increase the context and understanding for your first students. So that's, I, I love that example. Yeah. I think it really speaks to the, the paragraph that you have this, it's the second to last paragraph in your piece that talks about as um, I, this was written as the school year begins for a little further into it now, but um, as students like enter the classroom, you're, you're sharing, like get to know your students, who they are, what they care about, provide yeah. the mirrors and windows, and then engage them in conversations about, the world around them and the events impacting humanity, which 
I would say, let's go back all the way to the beginning of time and move forward from there. <laughs> so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, again, like thinking about, I, I know some schools, of course, came back last year in certain hybrid ways and some schools were back in full and, and some uh, teachers in schools didn't see students like for the entire year. And so like we're back and, um, you know, just like that opportunity, like, again, like we have our four walls in of the classroom and then we have like our school, but like the world is our school too. And there's a lot going on outside of the context and they're, everybody's bringing it in. We're not like just this one yeah. tiny academic part, you know, like we're everything. <laughs> and so, um, I, you know, I was talking earlier about like, what, what are those like, a, like opportunities to engage in those conversations and, um, share resources about like, you know, what, what is happening in the world around us? And like, um, you know, I, I think, you know, students are getting images of everything, like from, you know, what's going on in Afghanistan to protest in America to, um, you know, the, like everything is accessible now. So uh, then it's really thinking about um, how do we engage them in those meaningful ways um, about those conversations and um, help them to become critical thinkers and um, care about the world around them. And I will say like in my first couple of years, another I've, I've used, this is my second gut <laughs> comment, but like <laughs> I, I had this like thought of what I, I wanted my classroom to look like in, and um, what I envisioned for my students. I, and I will say I, in my first couple of years, I didn't have those specific skills and mm -hmm. practices yet. And so um, I think like powerful professional development changed me as a teacher. Um, and then it gave me some of those skills that I'm still learning to this day because For these sure. are complicated ways of like engaging our students and it's um, robust and rich and like developing those kind of practices. But like how, how to have conversations with students about current events and how to do that in ways that are safe for them and they feel like they can talk about in the classroom. Um, and yep abilities for them to bring their perspectives and themselves into the conversations. Um, it's, it's nuanced and there's amazing resources out there. Um, mm -hmm. one that I, that changed me was definitely facing history in ourselves. Um, and, and that way to talk about history and current events in ways that were, um, uh, you know, pretty powerful for, for students and, and myself, like that was, um, you know, something that I, I still use strategies, um, to the state. So yeah, just thinking through like, what, what do I envision for my students? Like, what do I want for them to walk out of this classroom with? And, and like, like, do I want them like to understand this world and like be, you know, better citizens and human beings? Like, okay, like how can I do that through my curriculum and like mm -hmm. my books and the, our conversations and how can we like kind of co-create that too? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for naming that resource too. I know that I'm, I would imagine some teachers out there might just avoid like having those tough conversations <laughs> because sure. if they don't, if they don't know how to have them. So I think that that's really helpful for, for teachers who might, might need that support. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes me think of, this is, this is not tangential, I promise. But, um, one of the people that I follow on Instagram, her name's Dr. Becky and I'm totally obsessed with her Melissa Gnosis. <laughs> um, she, she does a lot. She's a clinical psychologist. Um, and actually clinical might not be the right word. She's a psychologist and, uh, she does a lot of work with kids and, um, parenting and how to support parents in supporting their kids. And it's really, um, tangible, which is what I love. Like, it's like, here are some words you can use. <laughs> um, and here's why, you know, we're using these words and here's why it's important. Um, but, the one of the her posts today, and it's something that she talks about all the time, is that feelings don't scare kids. Being alone with feelings scares kids. And I think it, that speaks to me when we talk about these big topics, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of adults shy away from these topics. Like my kids reading about the Holocaust, I could have easily been like, oh, gosh, that was a horrible time in history, and then shut the conversation down. But that's why would I do that? Right. My kid is wanting, is curious about something yeah. that happened in history. She wants to learn more. And I want to be there alongside her and walk with her in, even if the feelings are not happy and 
a lot of history or a lot of things that happen in our world aren't happy, but it's, it's being with their, with them and helping them process it. And I think that as mm-hmm. educators, if we can kind of take, take that as well and, and walk with our students, like you shared, you know, Shiva through these things, like be there to support them and, and learn about how we can support them through these difficult topics that, that will come up. Um, and, you know, not, not even difficult, just ones that impact our humanity. So I love that, that that's, um, that that's top of mind and that does shine through in, in your piece. So that's, that's great. Um, I'm curious, like, um, do you have any like final thoughts for listeners as we're, we're coming to a close as we're, we're bringing this in to the finish line, any thoughts that you're like, this is, this is a must this is our piece of That's advice. Oh, yeah. Piece of advice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Asking Shiva for our advice. Yeah. I, was <laughs> I uh, thanks. I um, I'm just thinking again to like this unique world we're in right now, and yeah. this unique opportunity that um, I've heard so many educators say so beautifully for us to like start over or try new things um, with mm-hmm. our students to to really deepen the learning and deepen your relationships with them. So I think like, I mean, my <laughs> advice or whatever is like, just, <laughs> just to, to um, be open to the journey of where your what your students are telling you and where um, you want to go with them. And yes, there, I, you know, to that point, Melissa made earlier, like we do have like things we have to follow and things that are, part of like the mandate, right. of course, but, um, just the, the many other entry points we can think of to keep building those relationships and seeing every single student in your classroom will like, you know, change us as I think educators, but also like give them such opportunity too. So, um, it's kind of this bigger lofty kind of, you know, uh, yeah. um, thought, but, uh, like uh, how it gets into practice then is, is the beauty of it. And like how, how you decide to do it, um, is, is based on who you and your students are. So I just like wish the best for teachers this year and schools and, um, and, and thinking of this as a unique moment in our time where we can change things. Yeah. Do you mind sharing that resource that you shared earlier one more time? Sure. Uh, facing history and ourselves. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll say also there's specific strategies that they name on their website related to like, um, conversations you can have with your students, um, in, in like strategic ways, uh, and, and a wide swath of resources, um, about history and, um, current events and, uh, just a, a depth to what they've been doing for, I think like over 25, 30 years. So. Cool. Okay. cool. Okay. I will link that. Um, thank you for sharing that. I'll link that in the show notes. We appreciate that. Absolutely. And of course we'll link your article oh, so yes, people can absolutely. read it. <laughs> Although we've, we've talked about most of what's in the article, but that's okay. That's <laughs> <good too. laughs> <It's> like, <okay. laughs> uh, it was so lovely to meet you, Shiva. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you yeah. so much. We appreciate yeah. your time. Thank yeah. you so much for talking thank with you. us. Thanks for connecting. <laughs> yeah. Have a really good rest of your day. You too. Thanks, Shiva. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening, Literacy Lovers. Be sure to visit our website to subscribe to our newsletter and podcast. It's literacypodcast.com. Yep. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Most of them are at Literacy Podcast. Yes. And please, please, please reach out to us. Melissa, what's our email address? Melissa and Lori at literacypodcast.com is our email address. And we love getting emails from you all. And <laughs> Lori we and really I really read them. Yeah, and we, we really, really respond. Fun. We just love, we love when you all reach out and we, we get to have conversations with you. So please, please email yep. us. Let us know what you're thinking, what you're thinking about literacy, what you're thinking about ideas for us to podcast about. Yes. Ideas for <laughs> podcasting, anything. We, we love to hear from you, what you liked, what you want. Yeah, We're here but for you. Mostly y'all are asking questions, which is great. Yes. <laughs> we don't mind that either. Yes. We're so glad you're here to learn with us. Thank you, everybody. 